This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And welcome back to the X-Zone, everyone. We're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell, and uh, we're coming to you live and around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network, X-Zone Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable and our growing family of broadcast affiliates right across Canada, the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, Pacific Rim, Asia, India, Africa, and Europe. Before I get to my guest of this hour, Kevin Randall, I think that we should do something here. It's Cal Korf's 50th birthday today. Now, we were going to call Cal and wish him a happy birthday, but we didn't know which phone booth to call. You know, every time we'd talk to Cal here on the show, uh, we'd always get these different numbers. And finally, we realized that what he was doing was going from phone booth to phone booth to from phone booth to phone booth. We never had the same number twice. So, uh, Cal, uh, wherever you are, happy birthday and uh, congratulations on the new website that is out. And uh, joining me now is Kevin Randall. And Kevin, do you remember the time when... You were spo- you you and Cal were supposed to come on the show to debate the Roswell incident, and he never showed. Absolutely, remember that. In fact, as I was preparing for the show in the days leading up to it, because as you know, we we had that all set up yep. uh, for the day. My wife kept saying to me, "What are you and Rob going to talk about for four hours?" <laughs> Meaning she knew full well that Cal would show up. <laughs> Yeah, no, I. this guy here is a legend in his own mind. In fact, there is a new website that is dedicated to him, and I don't have the URL in front of me. Kevin, do you know it by any chance? Uh, if I uh, give me a second here, I may be able to come up with it. All right, well, what we'll do is when we go to commercial break, uh, Kevin and I will uh, we'll find that uh, URL and we'll pass it on because the information that is in that website is is just astounding, and uh, to all the Corfers who worked so hard getting that website done, congratulations on a great job. Uh, it's about time that all the information was put together to let the world know exactly who and what Cal Corf is, and hopefully we'll be able to um, put an end to his reign of terror. But as I was telling you, Kevin, that this is the kind of attention Cal likes, so who knows, we may be flaming the fire. Yeah, and that's been the discussion among the people who were putting this together mm-hmm. was that it might just uh, be something that, that he t- delights in because it's attention for him. You've got a new book out. Congratulations. Thank you. Tell us Thank about you. it. It's called Reflections of a UFO Investigator, and mm-hmm. what it does is sort of chronicle my life as it relates to UFOs. In other words, it begins with my teenage years and goes up to, um, I think, 2009, and it talks about the various investigations I've been involved in, what I've learned during the time, and, and how I came about the information. Mm-hmm. And what I found interesting about the book as I was putting it together was a lot of the stuff seems to be solved. You know, we'd, we'd talk about, or I talk about early on, the uh, Carol Wayne Watts sort of abduction contact that took place in 1968, and I investigated this merely because at the time I was in flight school in 
at Fort Walters, Texas, and the news had broken about this guy having this, this contact with UFOs, which wasn't that far from where flight school was. And since we could get three-day passes, I got a three-day pass and went up and interviewed the guy about what he had seen and what, what transpired. And reading the transcript and listening to the interview um, as I was putting the book together, mm -hmm. I realized the guy wasn't very imaginative because he's talking about being aboard the craft and they've got pencils where they're using to, to, to calculate the, uh, uh, I guess, navigate the, the craft. And I'm thinking in today's world, we've got Google Earth. And granted, these people were supposedly from Mars, but we've mapped Mars from Earth. So surely if there were Martians with the capability exactly. of traveling this interplanetary distance, they would have been able to, to map Earth much better than using paper maps, for crying out loud. Kevin, you and I have to take a two-minute commercial break. We'll be right back. Exxon Nation, Kevin Randall is our special guest this hour. And Kevin and I return on the other side of this two-minute commercial break as the Exxon continues with yours truly, Rob McConnell, from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My dialogue with divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called RISE, May 8th through the 12th, 2017 and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony, a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. A small deposit is required now to reserve your space as this retreat, it will sell out. For more details, please go to johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha and I'll see you in mystical Maui. Exxon Nation, uh, Kevin Randall is our guest to this hour. It's always great having Kevin with us. And he's got a new book that has just come out. It's called Reflections of a UFO Investigator. It's available online. And, of course, you can go to the big guy, Amazon.com. And, uh, Kevin, can we say that this is your autobiography pertaining to UFOs? Oh, absolutely. And, that's, and that was the whole purpose, just kind of explain 
what I'd done, what I'd seen, and how mm-hmm. I got to those places. And, and it was getting questions from people, how do you become a UFO investigator? And, and the answer is, well, mm-hmm. it really doesn't pay. You have to have a sideline to make it work. And my sideline to make it work was, of course, writing, writing articles and books about UFOs. But, but it, it just tells the story of how I got from the beginning uh, as a teenager to where I am today and my, my opinions and beliefs about UFOs. Now, before we went to the break, we were talking about a case that you investigated uh, while you were on flight training. You took a three-day pass. And um, tell us more about this. The, the, the person who, who made the report said that the ETs were using pencils? Pencils and paper as, as he uh, was taken on board the craft, that they had some kind of a fluoroscope machine that they, they used to X-ray him. Uh, he walked by a rack of stuff he thought was weapons, and I'm thinking, how would you possibly know what an alien weapon looked like? Um, he suggested they were from Mars, or they told him they were from Mars. And, and, and the thing that struck me in today's world is, why would they be using paper maps? Why exactly. wouldn't they have something a little better? And I mean, I can look at the entire Earth now with Google Earth, mm-hmm. And, and granted, if you were from Mars, you wouldn't have Google Earth, and you wouldn't have had it in 1968 when this took place. But but you're an inter, you're a, a race that can travel interplanetary distances, so you're obviously technologically advanced, and you could have observed Earth from from Mars for a long period of time. So you'd have had something equivalent to to Google Earth to 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 map your your flight out. Uh, he took a short flight. They. Uh, came back, and then later on, he was um, going to be given a lie detector test. He, he said he wanted to be given a lie detector test, and he uh, said on the way to the test, he was waylaid by the men in black, I suppose. And they had uh, told him he'd better flunk the test or else, so he got there and flunked it and uh, said that the whole thing was a hoax. It, the the case is reported in the Project Blue Book files mm-hmm. um, from Loco, Texas, believe it or not, which is near um, Amarillo, uh, up in up in the panhandle of Texas. But it, it, it was interesting simply because here was a case where I actually went into the field far from home <laughs> to, to interview a guy about his UFO experiences, and, and I showed up at his place mm-hmm. in my car, which, of course, would have a sticker on it from the uh, military sticker on it, and I had my really short military haircut. And uh, so I figured the reason he talked to me is he believed I was military, but he never asked, and I didn't tell him right. I was. Uh, but but he sat down, and we chatted for a while, and I asked him one of the standard questions is, well, have you read anything about UFOs? Do you, do you uh, believe in UFOs? And he said, no, he hadn't done it. But I'd given him um, a, a business card, and he opened a desk drawer to put it in. There was a whole bunch of UFO books inside. And so I figured, well, we we can't believe this guy, but but it's a it's a case that's gotten very very little publicity beyond 1968, and the only reason I brought it up is because I had a long interview with this guy, and I thought it was kind of interesting to see how these sort of things have evolved from 1968 to where we are today. How have they evolved, Kevin? Uh, like, first of all, did you ever find out what the rationale was behind this person making this report, which obviously is bogus? I think one of the things that we understand in today's environment is the, the draw of the spotlight is very powerful. So even if there's not sort of a monetary mm-hmm. reward for something like this, the fact that you've got your name in the newspapers or people are, are calling you from around the country to, to learn what you've said is a very, very powerful draw. Uh, he, at once, once he had said it was a hoax and, and it kind of went away, uh, he, never, he never surfaced. He, he, he died um, two or three years ago. Uh, so I, 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 something something like that possessed him to do that. Now, when I say evolved, this was sort of a contactee abduction thing where um, he, he uh, went on board the craft, was, was uh, examined by them. They took him for a ride. They brought him back. And, and in today's world, we don't have really the contactee aspects of it anymore. The, the abduction phenomenon now is... They kind of take you whether you want to go or not. And in this case, he, he was sort of a contactee. So that's kind of the evolution there uh, from, from that to this. In your opinion, Kevin, what is the most compelling case that there is that that you look at and say, yes, they're really here? I think based on evidence, based on the number of witnesses, based on the interaction with the environment, I'd have to say the Loveland case from 1957. 
you had witnesses at 13 separate locations talking about seeing the object, seeing it interacting with the environment, stalling car engines, stalling, you know, uh, causing radios to fade out, mm -hmm. headlights to dim, that sort of thing. And you had it all take place on November 2nd, um, 1957, in a very short period of time, and you had a lot of people calling the sheriff's department talking about this, so you, you had them reporting it in without the media, uh, the immediacy of the media getting involved. And it wasn't until the next day that people learned about what was going on. So you had a lot of people uh, who had come forward in that time frame to talk about this without being influenced by, by the media telling them about it. Today, if, if there's a UFO sighting, uh, you can almost watch it live on, on the Internet. That's right. Uh, but, but in those days, that, that, didn't, that simply didn't happen. So you had, a, you had an awful lot of that. You, you have the Air Force, uh, in essence, lying about, about the case, and, and, I, and I say that because Don Kehoe, who, had, who was the director of NICAP, was telling people that there were nine witnesses to this case. And the Air Force said, no, no, that's a lie. There were only three. Well, both Kehoe and the Air Force were wrong. There, there were witnesses at 13 separate locations. And I can document that from today mm -hmm. by looking at the files and the newspapers and everything else that we have. But the Air Force said, well, we went and investigated it, and, and it was just sort of a, a ball lightning type thing. There just wasn't much to it. And that's, you know, that's completely and totally bogus. So I think that's a very good case. And had it been investigated properly in 1957, I think we'd have an awful lot of answers that we don't have today. But, but everybody was so busy fighting over the reality of the case that they never really got down to the investigation of the case. And we lost a lot of things. There's, there's indications there was physical traces left behind mm -hmm. that nobody really bothered to get to. So today we can say, well, there's indications there were physical traces, but we don't know exactly what, what they were. And had they done it right in 57, we'd have that information. We'd probably have samples. We'd have good photographs. So I think that's a very compelling case. Kevin, over the years, has the type of craft changed has the craft evolved uh, are we are you getting different reports of of uh, more spectacular crafts or are have the crafts remained the same over the years once again we got an evolution and we can go back to the 1897 airship if you want mm -hmm. uh, these were a series of sightings uh, in 1897 in the United States, there were other airship sightings in other parts of the world at different times, but the 1897 airship. And and if you look at the descriptions there, what you've got is sort of a uh, Zeppelin-shaped object with lights on it, sometimes with motors. Um, so you, what, you, what you've got is, is what people were expecting to see based on the technology of the times, because it was right about... I mean, there were hot air balloons, mm -hmm. uh, there were helium-filled balloons, there was a lot of ballooning going on, there were a lot of lighter-than-air craft. And so you kind of got that through the 1897 airship. But when we get to the 1940s and the Ken Arnold sighting, he sees objects that are sort of crescent-shaped or saucer-shaped. And we, we got those, we got ball-shaped objects, we had um, cigar-shaped objects, again, sort of like the airship. Yeah. But, but now it's kind of evolved in mostly triangular-shaped objects. Um, so, you know, the question becomes, are we sort of slaves to our um, environment, meaning what is current in our inventory of, of aircraft is now what we're looking, what we're seeing in the way of alien spacecraft or alleged alien spacecraft, or are we dealing with different um, societies, uh, alien societies coming to Earth, and they're using the craft that, that they have, and they have different kind of craft just as as American aircraft are somewhat different than Canadian aircraft and British aircraft and French aircraft and, and Soviet aircraft. Um, so, you know, you can look at all of those sorts of sorts of things. So there is sort of evolution of what, what the craft are, but there's also some continuity involved in there as well. You know, uh, when uh, John Mack was uh, still with us and uh, there, there were heavy heavy sightings there were there were people who were reporting uh being abducted by aliens bud hopkins was really uh busy at the time and involved uh, it seems that this has all gone to the wayside we don't hear about alien abductions anymore and i think i think that's more a reflection of media interest than anything else uh the research is still going on there's still people uh who who claim to have been abducted there's still an awful lot of uh, 
research is involved in this, mm-hmm. but but you know, as as you mentioned, John Mack is, is gone. Uh, Bud Hopkins just died. Yes. Uh, um, um, Jacob David Jacobs is entangled in some kind of a legal battle over uh, alleged uh, things he had done with with one or more of his abductees. Uh, but if you if you go to the, the UFO conferences and that sort of thing, you still see an awful lot about the abductions. Now, in in reflections, I talk a little bit about my experience with abductions, and and I think based on what Russ Estes, Bill Cohn, and I were able to to find out in 1997, that that uh, the abduction phenomenon is more terrestrially based than it is extraterrestrial. We just don't really see an extraterrestrial component. And the research that we were complaining about in 1997, which is more or less case study, mm-hmm. psychological case study, hasn't really evolved. It's, it's remained static from that time, even though we made suggestions on how to improve it and what, what we should be looking for. None of that's been done, so it's kind of re- remained the same. But um, I think our interests, and when I say that, I mean society in general, have evolved into other things. So we're not that interested in uh, UFOs right now or abductions because we have a lot of other problems we're dealing with. Kevin, stand by, my friend. You and I have to take a news break at the bottom of the hour. Congratulations on a new book, Kevin. Kevin Randall is my guest this hour. His new book, Reflections of a UFO Investigator, it's available online at Amazon.com. And Kevin and I will return on the other side of this commercial break with the news as the Exxon continues with yours truly, Rob McConnell, from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. That was dedicated to Cal Corf. By the way, the website uh, that uh, Kevin and I were talking about before is www.freecurtis.org. That's F-R-E-K-U-R-T-I-S. Dot O-R-G. Kevin Randall's my special guest this hour. Uh, Kevin is a good friend of the Exxon uh, radio show. He's got a brand new book out, Reflections of a UFO Investigator, and it's available at Amazon.com and other fine bookstores everywhere. It's going to be available for Kindle, I understand. Am I right, Kevin? It is on Kindle even oh, as we speak. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so we were talking about alien abductions, we talked about the progression of the technology of UFOs. What has been your personal experience when it comes to UFOs, alien abductions, contact? Looking back at the road I took to get there, uh, I I always vacillated between, yes, they're extraterrestrial, no, they're not. There's there's terrestrial explanations. And Mm -hmm. I think by the time I've gotten to this point, what I see is, yeah, there is some alien visitation, but it's nowhere near as frequent as a lot of us had believed in the past. In fact, Carl Flock and I were talking about this um, several years before he died, and what we were complaining about was that we didn't seem to get the same kind of robust UFO sightings that we'd gotten in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. I mean, you had 
sightings with lots of people involved and lots of stuff going on mm-hmm. and, and interaction with the environment. And it seemed that we got caught up in the abduction phenomenon. So basically you're talking about seeing alien creatures and that sort of thing going on. But the UFO sightings just didn't have the same sort of robust nature that they had in the past. Yeah, we get some good ones, but not not the way we had in the past. So that kind of an evolution there as well, where we move from those really interesting stuff to, well, there's a light in the sky, and you're going, yeah, so uh, what else is new? Um, so that that's kind of the one one of the things that that, that we looked at, and 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 I and I saw that progression as I was working on the book. Uh, the really good stuff seems to have been in the past. Is it that? The sightings were that more intriguing, or were we just that naive back in those days that what could have been a UFO was actually a terrestrial craft? The sightings were much more interesting, uh, and, and I, it, it it wasn't necessarily that that we were more naive. What uh, statistics have shown us is mm-hmm. that the higher the level of education of the witness, and the longer the object is in sight, the less likely it is to be in to be identified. In other words, people with a higher level of education or more sophistication have more worldly experiences and are able to identify what to others might be anomalous phenomenon. Uh, they can they can pin it down, and the longer they see it, the the better their their um, uh, observations are. So you know you look at it from that point of view, but it just seems that that the stuff was much more interesting than it than it was in nineteen seventy three for example, yeah, there were a few abductions involved in that, but you had a lot of sightings with the uh, craft on the ground and the creatures outside the craft doing things or interacting with with, with uh, the environment that way, and there were landing trace cases and things like that and today we just don't seem to get that same sort of flavor other than rarely it seems that in the past we got it more frequently in fact the 1973 uh, wave suggested to me because it took place from the the last week of september to about the first week of november so you got about six weeks of very intense activity in there in 73 and if we had visited another planet um given given the technical difficulty to do so we would gather as much information much data as we could in that short period of time and bring it home to analyze it and it's always struck me that the um, sightings that we were getting out of that that era with that kind of things they were gathering a lot of stuff without bothering to analyze analyze what they were gathering they were just grabbing it so when they got home they'd have a lot of stuff to look at if these were ufos from other other places, other planets, other star systems, other galaxies, other planets within our own solar system. Why would they send manned craft or craft that were that were that were driven or controlled by extraterrestrials instead of sending robotic craft like we do to Mars and to the moon? It may be that the the beings we've seen outside the craft, at least in some of these sightings, were robotic. Really. Or they were, or they were some kind of cyborg, or some kind of, of um, created entity to to gather the data. So you might be exactly right. It might be that um, they have a sense of adventure the way we do. And and you know, you could say is was a really a point of putting somebody on the moon. Uh, what did we, what knowledge did we gain by doing so that we couldn't have done robotically? And and a uh, part of it is just the nature of of the human human beast, and it may be the same thing with the aliens. You know, it's really hard to speculate about the, the motivations of an alien race without uh, some more intimate knowledge of that mm-hmm. alien race. Uh, you know, Russ Estes and I would talk about this periodically, and, and his comment was always, well, we're talking about another intelligence, so at least we have that much in common. We, we may not have much else in common, but at least we have the intelligence in common. And so we might be able to speculate in those directions, but we really don't have any good answers for those sorts of questions. When it comes to the conspiracy theory that is that is very much alive out there these days, what do you think it would take for the governments of the world, I mean, let's talk about the U.S. government right now, for the U.S. government to come clean? I don't think the U.S. government is going to come clean unless forced to do so. And that force would be the alien spacecraft landing uh, and saying, yeah, here we are. And at that point, you can't say, no, they're not there. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
uh, at that point, the U.S. government is going to have to say, yep, there they are. I don't think there's much that, that we as private citizens, either Canadian or, or American, could do to force the U.S. government to change its policy on keeping stuff hidden about UFOs. We, we can prove that they've kept stuff hidden right? Uh, as, as we've gotten our hands on documents through FOIA and things like that. And, and, and the best example is Project Moondust, which when the State Department inadvertently released some documents through FOIA that mentioned Project Moondust, when a United States Senator, Jeff Bingaman, wrote to the Air Force and said, you know, what, what's, what's going on with Moondust? And, and the Air Force wrote back and said, there's no such project, never existed. When confronted with the documents that had come from the State Department, said Moondust, and, and clearly related to UFOs, not mm-hmm. all of Moondust was UFO-related, but some of them was, they wrote back and said, oh, yeah, we'd like to amend our last statement. Uh, yeah, there was a project Moondust, we just never used it. Well, we, we have documents that prove that, that it was actually deployed. So we can prove that the U.S. government has investigated UFOs. They've, they've, they've hidden what they've done behind the uh, veil, I guess, of national security. And, and we can demonstrate all that. But what we don't have is the final ultimate proof, which is they have the, they have a, they have the evidence that it's extraterrestrial in nature. We just don't have that from the U.S. government. Do you think that in the past there has been reverse engineering? that has been conducted, and if there has been, how come we're still so far behind when it comes to space flight and anything else that we might have been able to acquire from the crashed saucers? I look at it from the point of view, if we had crashed, let's say we were time travelers, you and I, and we'd yep. gone back to 1947, and we'd, we'd crashed our airplane, and uh, the the people there picked up um, the CDs that were scattered around. Well, they got little silver discs, but they don't mm-hmm. know how to read them. Uh, you know, it's just silver discs with nothing on them. And, and how do you how do you access that information? Well, today we understand how to access that information, but then then we couldn't. If we'd taken a, a VCR and a power pack and a TV back to Merlin the Magician and said duplicate this, well, he's got to understand two things that are invisible: magnetism and electricity. And if he can understand those and he knows the proper sequence, he can take that black ribbon of a videotape and he can get pictures and sound. So what I think is that the technology is still so far beyond us that we have not been able to crack the codes. And, and I, I speculate, and I always say this, I, I speculate that some of the, the, the idea of the, um, the composite materials we use in, in aircraft and spacecraft today may have been suggested by something they picked up um, 50 or 60 years ago, but I don't know that for sure. Almost everything else mm-hmm. we can look at, we can say, well, you know, there's an evolution and a history of how that stuff developed. Well, they, the, the transistor, well, yeah, but the, the work was being done in the 1930s and 19, early 1940s on the transistor, so there wasn't a quantum leap in technology that you'd expect. And the, the only answer I can think of is that the technology is so far beyond us that we can't understand it. And our technology today is so far beyond anything they had in, in, in the 1940s. I mean, well, even look at Star Trek, and I always joke about this. My cell phone is better than the Star Trek communicator. That's right. Yeah. Because my cell phone gives me access to all the knowledge of the human race if I just know how to use my darn cell phone properly. I ask, and, ask a child. They know better than we do. <laughs> But, but, but the point simply is, uh, in the 1960s, they're postulating the Star Trek communicator that can do these things mm-hmm. that were extraordinary in the 1960s, but it's so, we're so far beyond that in today's environment, it's unbelievable. So I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that has got to be the answer, that we've attempted to reverse engineer that. And as our technology improves, we apply it to what we may have found, but we still haven't cracked the codes. Exo Nation, Kevin Randall is our special guest to this hour, and uh, he is the author of a brand new book that that we're talking about, Reflections of a UFO Investigator. It's available at Amazon.com. And Kevin, uh, in your book, I'm sure you write about Roswell, New Mexico, which is the mecca for UFO investigators. Uh, has there been any any advances in the investigation into what really happened in Roswell? In the book, I talk about um, what I had, had had been involved in that. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, people, have, when they've run, written reviews of the book, said, well, a third of it's devoted, devoted to Roswell. Well, two-thirds isn't. 
uh, what, 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 what we're doing now is with Tom Carey and Don Schmidt and a couple of other people, Dave Rudier, for example, uh, Chris Rukowski from, from Canada. Yeah, Chris, yeah. Uh, uh, we're attempting what we call a cold case investigation of Roswell, looking at it, looking at everything again, mm-hmm. looking at it carefully, seeing, you know, does Project Mogul make sense uh, with what we know about it today? Uh, are there answers that make sense? Are there places where we went astray? Well, obviously, there were places we went astray. Frank Kaufman springs to mind immediately. But looking at it to see if we can bring um, our hindsight, if you will, to what, what, what we've done in the past and what mm-hmm. we can do in the future and see if we can't resolve some of the issues surrounding the Roswell case. So we're looking at that. In, in Reflections, I talk about what, what I had done up until... Um, around the time that, that I got involved with the, the National Guard and, and had my time <laughs> uh, utilized by the U.S. Army, more so than UFO investigation. But, uh, so we're, we're taking a look at Roswell to see if we can, we can come to a consensus about some of it. One of the interesting things is the, the Ramey Memo, for example, this, this document that Roger Ramey is holding. Well, we've got a providence because Ramey's holding it. We know when the picture was taken because we got the documentation from a number of sources. If we can come to a consensus about what this thing says, then we might we might learn something very valuable. We might learn that that document says, well, it was weather blown, or we might learn that it says something that that suggests it wasn't a weather blown, and and so we're we're attempting that from a number of different. Uh, different uh, attack angles to see if we can come up to a consensus with that, that everybody, well, not everybody, but, mm-hmm. but a lot of people accept, so, yeah, the methodology was right. Yes, I can see how this came about. Yes, this makes sense. Hypothetically, if it turns out that the events of Roswell had nothing to do with a crashed UFO, but a weather balloon or Project Mogul, what would this do to the UFO community? I think it would be heartbreaking. <laughs> For, if for nothing else, mm-hmm. uh, because I think a lot of people have pinned their hopes on this being the case that will prove it's extraterrestrial. There's a lot of other very good evidence out there, and and that suggests extraterrestrial. But it, it it's like so many of the other classic cases. Uh, Thomas Mantell, I'm pretty well convinced chased a balloon. Uh, Mantell was killed chasing the balloon. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of things that went on, but. But looking at the records, the records that were, were classified at one point and, and understanding more about hypoxia, which is the lack of oxygen in the blood and how that affects brain function, um, leads us to that conclusion. Um, the Charles Witted case, which was this wonderful airline pilot case, and they saw the object coming at us and it, it, or at them and it blew by them and they saw a cigar shape with, with windows on it. I am now convinced, based on the work of the meteorite men, if nothing else, the, the guys on the Science Channel to go out searching for meteorites and some of the uh, video footage that is available now, that what they saw was a meteor. Uh, there's, there's really no question in my mind that was what they had seen and the way these things break up. It gives you the impression of mm-hmm. square windows on a, on, a, on a craft. That hasn't destroyed the UFO um, community. Right. It, it says, well, we've, we've solved this. Let's move on. If Roswell blows up, I think it's going to be quite a blow to the UFO community. But there, there are other things to look at. Uh, it, but it's going to be it's going to be a heartbreaking situation if it turns out that we can find a terrestrial explanation that makes sense. My God, imagine that Cal Korf being right—that's scary. Kevin Randall is um, my special right for guest. The wrong reasons. <laughs> my, Kevin Randall's our guest this hour. Reflections of a UFO investigator is his new book. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. In over 36 years in law enforcement, I've learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, extraterrestrials, and UFOs. How we gather that evidence of their existence, preserve that same evidence, and present it to a court of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. Come with me on a journey that seeks to prove with undisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Join me, Larry Lawson, host of the Paranormal Stakeout, coming to the X-Zone Broadcast Network. Check out the broadcast schedule for Paranormal Stakeout with yours truly, Larry Lawson, at www.xzbn.net. 
For more information about me, my travels, and my team, check out our website at www.paranormalfbi.com or join us on Facebook at Florida Bureau of Paranormal. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, Kevin Randall's my special guest this hour. He's got a new book out. Reflections of a UFO Investigator. It's available at Amazon.com. And as always, Kevin, it's great talking to you. Uh, you know, you're you're the most level-headed person in ufology that I've had the pleasure of talking to over the years. So keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now, you and I were chatting over the commercial break uh, about, you know, I, I I said with a with a big grin on my face that that you know if 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 mogul proves to be the reason for the the uh, UFO hoopla and, and Mecca and Roswell, you know, Cal Korf would get something right. But you actually have proof that it had nothing to do with uh, Mogul. Well, let me say first that, that the idea was not original with Cal Korf. I think Robert Todd was the one that came up with Mogul, and, mm-hmm. and Carl Flock also endorsed it. So Cal Korf kind of glommed on to their research and, and took it. So it really wasn't wasn't his idea. In, in typical, in typical, in typical. Well, let me get this out right. In typical Korf fashion. Yes. Okay. But one of the things we wanted to do was look at Mogul. Uh, as dispassionately as we could, mm-hmm. and I think based on some of the documentation we've been able to find, and one of the things we've, we've attempted to do is find the NOTAMs, which are notice to airmen, were published by, the at the time, the CAA, the F, FAA, uh, Federal Avi- Aviation Administration, that that uh, the mobile flights had to be, had to be, um, had, had, had to be uh, uh, announced through the, through the NOTAMs. Mm-hmm. And, and given the documentation we've been able to find, uh, it is now pretty clear that Mogul is not the answer. And I think, I think that when we get the final documentation in hand, we're going to be able to prove that it wasn't a Mogul balloon, which is not to say we won't be able, we, we, we've proven it is extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've just proved this specific terrestrial explanation does not solve the mystery of what fell at Roswell. Looks like you've got a lot of hard work ahead of you, my friend. Absolutely. And, and uh, I've, I've got like a dozen emails from various members of the team mm-hmm. uh, to, to look at here in the next few minutes as, as the investigation com- continues. I mean, we've, we found an awful lot of people who are still alive from, from that time frame who are, who are adding to our, our basic knowledge of that and, and family members and things like that. So we're finding some interesting, interesting stuff. Um, as we continue the investigation, what we're really looking for is documentation and, and some uh, other more tangible evidence as we move forward. Kevin, if people want to find out more about you or contact you with some information that they may have pertaining to Roswell or any other UFO event, how can they do that? Take a look at my blog, which is kevinrandall.blogspot.com. A different perspective, just type a different perspective into your search engine, you'll get to me. There's addresses on there, and you can, you can contact me through that. And uh, how can they, uh, they can get a copy of your new book, Reflections of a UFO Investigator, as we've been saying online at Amazon.com? Yes. Any final yes. thoughts for the Exxon Nation? I was just going to say you can get it on Kindle and have it, have it in your hand before we sign off. <laughs> there you go. There <laughs> uh, you if go. you want to do it. I, I, you know, the, the UFO thing is, is, is a continuing investigation where there are some of us, 
who are, who are legitimately trying to find the truth, and I, and I don't care whether it's a skeptical side or a, a UFO believer side, there's some of us who are really, really searching for the truth, and we're trying to put out the best information we have. And sometimes we get fooled, and sometimes we get it right. So we continue, we continue to march, and we continue to look for the truth, and that's really what we want to do. Kevin, thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations on another great book, Reflections of the UFO, by our guest this hour, Kevin Randall. It's available at Amazon.com, and like Kevin said, You know, in the next 27 seconds, you can download it on Kindle. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Uh, The X-Zone, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Once again, Reflections of a UFO Investigator by Kevin Randall. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away.